What is the backbone of millions of websites around the world? They were built using Drupal, the free open source content management system. It's leading a digital transformation across industries. From one hub to many, simple to complex. With swift page loading, an ease of content editing, multilingual capabilities, and rigorous security, Drupal is the platform that performs. 70% of universities use Drupal. Media rely on Drupal for extensive delivery of content. Governments count on Drupal. Finance and commerce sites need Drupal for security. Tourism destinations bring their clear waters and mountains to life on screens using Drupal. Are you marketing for the future? The next billion customers of digital experiences will probably never have a personal computer in their homes. Drupal scales video, audio, and text to all devices. Work from a centralized content hub. Stretch your strategy across sites and channels. Whether it's one site to many, or simple to complex, Drupal is the building block. Choose help along your journey with our partners. Dream big, Drupal will get you there. Good morning, DrupalCon. How's everybody doing today? Anyone, anyone go out last night? Was there uh, fun to be had out on the town in this beautiful city of Seattle? <laughs> awesome. Well, we're thrilled to have you here in the Emerald City, and I want to say that I'm uh, especially impressed with the Drupal community's navigational skills. This convention center's got sort of an MC Escher vibe going on with all those escalators, so really, really impressed that you all made it here. It looks like we've got a full house. Um, so, I'd love to welcome you all to the event, um, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Lennon, I'm Hestinet on Drupal.org, and I have had the privilege to serve as the Interim Executive Director for the Drupal Association since September, um, and it's really been an honor to be in that role, to serve this community, to work with the amazing Drupal Association staff, um, and to bring the whole Drupal community together for events like this, um, and for all the programs uh, that we undertake. This is a really special DrupalCon, um, and it merits a special kind of welcome message that's bigger than just a hello, thank you, good morning, goodbye. Uh, a lot's changed at the conference this year, um, and just from what I've seen in the early part of the week, I'm humbled by all the positive reactions that I've heard. Um, our community has grown uh, in terms of personas. Uh, there are the builders, the developers, the front-end designers, the UX designers, everyone who is involved in building digital experiences, in building Drupal itself. Um, all of you are here with us today. But beyond that, we've also brought in the content editors and the digital marketers who now have a dedicated track within DrupalCon. Um, and we're really excited about their presence here with us at the conference. Um, this uh, new track sold out like a month and a half in advance of the conference. It's been very successful. And we want to bring these audience together with us for all the future uh, DrupalCons moving forward. Similarly, we've created dedicated space for agency leaders to network with each other, to learn how the buyer has changed for um, Drupal installations and Drupal sites, and learn how to help grow the Drupal business ecosystem. And finally, we're bringing in decision makers and people at end user organizations of Drupal to close the feedback loop so that we understand their needs and where Drupal needs to go to support their use cases. But beyond that, uh, our community has grown in other ways. Uh, our thought leaders are increasingly diverse. Um, this is a quick graph of speaker representation at the last three North American DrupalCons. Uh, the gray uh, bar represents speakers who look like me, <laughs> your typical uh, white guy in IT with a ponytail. Uh, but the blue bar represents the sort of underrepresented speakers from a variety of audiences a number of, uh, across a number of axes of representation. And when we first began measuring this for our speaker audience, uh, at Baltimore, we had about a 33% representation of these groups. Uh, in Nashville, that grew to 40%. And here in Seattle, 50% of our speakers are from underrepresented groups. It's really phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, 
Also at this event, we doubled our grants and scholarships and speaker inclusion funds to help make this possible, to help bring people who might not otherwise be able to attend the event. Um, and we're thrilled that the changes we've made have enabled us to do that. The support of sponsors, the support of those people, um, uh, buying those tickets, all, all of this makes it possible for us to bring people who otherwise wouldn't be able to make it. So thank you to all of you who've helped enable us to do that. Um, On the same vein, our community itself is become, becoming more diverse and inclusive. Um, I want to give a special shout out to the diversity inclusion group who have led the way, pushing us to elevate the voices of underrepresented people, inspiring us to expand that speaker inclusion program, and who've rolled up their sleeves to do the work on Drupal.org and here at DrupalCon. Um, you can see some uh, statistics, uh, anonymized demographic information from the users who've opted to give it this information to us. Um, this is about, uh, this comes from about a 13% sample of the folks who've been active in the last year. Um, and these are some metrics that we're tracking and then want to continue to improve over time. But that work is never finished. The work of becoming a warm, more welcoming community, a more welcoming project, whether that's for personas, whether that's for people from underrepresented groups, and in many different ways, always continues. Um, and I was really excited last night uh, when the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Group announced a new initiative. They're uh, starting a speaker initiative to help further increase the number of uh, underrepresented people who feel confident in speaking, submitting sessions, um, and coming to DrupalCon and other events to share their knowledge and their insights. So um, last night uh, at the opening reception, they announced this initiative. Um, and I want to thank uh, Pantheon, who's offering to match the first donations up to $2,500, and the seed donors you see there. Um, who have uh, chipped in already, even though this just went live last night, um, to, to get us started. So if you'd like to get involved, there are some links you can use to learn more. Uh, finally, I want to give a quick update, uh, sort of a governance update. We've had a lot of conversations uh, over the past couple of years about evolving Drupal's governance. And in this particular area, I wanted to give an update about the community working group. Um, We've made a few changes uh, in supporting that community working group. They've adopted a new charter uh, in December of last year um, so that they can focus their programs in new ways. They, they're, they're no longer just a conflict resolution body, but they can focus proactively on community health, on leadership training. We can provide legal support for the community working group, and they have a new independent escalation body for any of their decisions and the, the situations that they uh, get into. Um, and so that escalation body that the community working group can rely on is made up of the community elected positions of the Drupal Association Board. So that's currently Suzanne and Ryan. And we've brought in a third party outside member um, to give, a, give us a perspective beyond just the Drupal community. So that's Joan O'Bacon who will be joining that review committee. Now I'd like to give you some updates on Drupal Association programs. Um, so first, uh, last year we talked a lot about the Promote Drupal initiative. Uh, this was sort of a, a one-time fundraised initiative to create something almost like uh, an initiative coordinator position, except not for uh, some code sprint, but for uh, promotional materials um, to create uh, consistent Drupal brand and strategic messaging and to connect new decision makers and influencers uh, throughout the world. This has been a global partnership. Um, the same way that we work or collaborate on code, on documentation, on UX, on events, um, it's an effort that spans the globe. Um, and I want to thank, in particular, many members of the European community who have led the way in the Promote Dru Drupal initiative and put together a lot of materials. And I want to share a quick sneak preview of some of these materials that are being made available. So this started off with a brand book um, for Drupal so that any materials that were going to be created as part of the initiative would have this consistent look and feel. Um, so it's an extremely <laughs> long document, so I'm just going to let it scroll through here. But it has all the guidelines, the color, the logo usage, uh, tone of voice, all of these things that help us make sure that all the materials uh, created by this group are going to be used in a consistent way. 
Uh, there was also a pitch deck that was put together as part of this effort um, that can be used collaboratively by any freelancer, any agency, uh, any individual who's trying to demonstrate the power of Drupal, trying to show what tremendous uh, sites, what case studies are out there. Um, again, it's just such a tremendous resource, but also tremendously long, so I'm flipping through it very, very quickly here. But there are some amazing stories there that when anyone in this room is having a conversation about Drupal and the power of Drupal and where it's used in the real world, this can help you uh, to show that to your prospective clients or whoever you're trying to educate about what we do. Um, if you want to participate in this, by the way, you can submit a case study to be included in this slide deck um, and you can get involved in the Promote Drupal initiative. Um, in addition to that, uh, another effort underway is a new case study format. This isn't live yet, so I'm just going to share a design mock, um, but we are intending to create a new version of the way the case study format on Drupal.org works that's more media-centric, more interactive, um, with more testimonials and statistics, something that's better targeted to the end user audience rather than just a sort of technical overview, although those details will be included as well. Finally, at the beginning of this presentation, you all saw that fantastic video that was put together as part of this initiative. So that video is being licensed under Creative Commons and again, being made available to anyone around the world, individual, agency, anyone who would like to promote Drupal uh, on any channel they have to any audience. Um, and I want to say some thank yous because the Promote Drupal initiative is not possible without the support of uh, many individuals and organizations. In particular, I'd like to thank the top contributors who helped build some of these materials first, uh, both individuals and organizations who did a lot of work to make those materials that I just showed you possible. But I'd also like to, uh, to thank the sponsors of this phase one of the Promote Drupal program. Uh, a lot of people came together when we put out a call for fundraising to make it possible uh, for us to do this work. So thank you very much. So next I'd like to talk about some updates from the, uh, some more updates from the association, in particular around Drupal.org tooling. I think something might have happened involving a, a new virtual assistant um, on April 1st that was helping everybody out. That was, that was really the big one, really exciting. Um, but actually, um, the main thing I'd like to talk about is our partnership with GitLab and the tooling upgrade that just happened uh, in the last two weeks um, on Drupal.org. Yes, thank you. So this has been a multi-year, multi-working group, multi-committee initiative, and we finally made a decision to move forward with a partner, in this case, GitLab, and we've completed that first phase of that work, um, which means that all of those code viewing links anywhere on Drupal.org and old issues and new issues and the sidebar of projects, all that stuff will now take you to the beautiful and much more usable code viewing interface in GitLab. Um, if you're a maintainer of a project, you can already use inline editing tools within that interface. Um, and coming next, we'll begin an incremental rollout of additional features, and that means merge requests are not too far away. Um, so we're really excited about this, really excited about these changes. We're still working together with the GitLab team uh, to make this happen. In fact, they're going to be here this week. There's a panel on Thursday morning if you have questions about this process or just want to hear about the journey. Um, so we're thrilled with this and thrilled to keep improving and involving the tooling uh, that the Drupal community uses. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about Drupal Steward, which is a new program that we hope to be introducing soon. Drupal Steward is born out of the idea that um, having to have your teams on red alert for a patch release, for a highly critical security release, can be difficult, frustrating, especially if you're a large enterprise, especially if you're not in the United States in these time zones. And so we work together with the security team to create a sort of joint service that we're developing to roll out. So this joint service is to create a web application firewall that will help protect sites from vulnerabilities ahead of the patch release. And we'll use those proceeds to support security team programs, to support association programs. So there's going to be a BOF uh, later today that I encourage you to join to learn more about how this is going to work. And now, a few thank yous, and by a few, I mean many. <laughs> um, first, a tremendous thank you to the Drupal Association staff. Um, without the help of the staff, none of this would have happened, 
and we are a small group of people. It's everyone, boots on the ground, everyone contributing in every way. Um, so this is your staff of the association. If you see them, say thank you. I also want to say thank you to our production partners. Uh, these are the people behind the scenes who set up the stage, who organized the AV, who've consulted with us on other parts of expanding the event. Um, they're great folks. If you run your own events, consider reaching out to them. Finally, I want to thank, well, not even finally, <laughs> I want to continue to thank our sponsors, including our diamond sponsors, Acquia, Pantheon, and Platform SH, all of our platinum sponsors, our gold level sponsors, silver level sponsors, bronze, and module sponsors who sponsor things like the special events like coffee or the women in Drupal luncheon, things like that. Um, I want to thank our supporting partners as well. The supporting partner program is what funds the work on Drupal.org. So for example, this transition to GitLab would not be possible if we did not have supporting partners to fund the engineering team. Similarly, all of the testing, the Drupal CI infrastructure, we simply couldn't afford it without the help of these supporting partners. So I want to thank our signature supporting partners, our premium supporting partners, and the classic supporting partners in our partner program. Um, finally, a special thanks to top individual contributors to the project. So as you know, we started tracking a contribution credit system. And uh, in no particular order, here are all the top uh, 75, I believe, uh, contributors over the last year um, in terms of contribution credits. Yes, a round of applause for these people who have moved Drupal forward. Absolutely. In addition, there are a number of organizations that sponsor this work, and I want to recognize the top organizations that do that as well. So these are the top organizational contributors, uh, those who have sponsored the most individual work uh, that made it into the Drupal project. So thank you very much to all of these people. And finally, thank you volunteers. There are so many of you here in the audience and so many more who can't be in this room because they're around the convention center making everything happen, making everything work. So one more big round of applause for the volunteers, please. All right, some quick housekeeping and updates uh, before we get into the rest of our programming. One, the code of conduct is critically important, and I wanted to talk about this pretty much at the top of my housekeeping session. DrupalCon is dedicated to being safe, inclusive, welcoming, and harassment-free. Rachel and Rebecca on the Drupal Association team can be a primary point of contact if you ever need to immediately make a call about a concern you might have. You can also use that email address, or talk to any member of staff who can connect you to the right person. So if anything should occur, please let these people know. Um, the Wi-Fi, yeah, it doesn't beat the code of conduct, but in case you don't have it already, here's your information. Um, on social media, you can promote us with the hashtags DrupalCon and Drupal Contribution, and you can follow DrupalCon NA for up-to-the-minute news about the event. Also, coffee. For the first time at DrupalCon, it will be free all day in the exhibit hall during exhibit hall hours. Yeah, I thought that would get applause. I was <laughs> pretty sure that was like the most important slide I had in this whole deck. Um, lunch will be served from 12 to 2 in the back of, back of the exhibit hall as well. Um, and the Women in Drupal luncheon will be happening from 12 to 2 in the sky bridge of the convention center. We actually kind of walked through that on our way here into this main stage. Um, and don't forget to come to Trivia Night on Thursday. Um, it'll be happening at the Armory. Uh, it's on 305 Harrison Street, sponsored by Palantir. It is a 21 plus event, so please don't forget your photo ID and the food and drink service will begin uh, just before nine. Um, immediately following Dries' keynote, we're going to do a group photo. It's relatively easy to find the place this year, I promise. We're all just gonna go straight out these doors and then back to the registration area, that big uh, M.C. Escher looking atrium, um, and do the photo there. Uh, one more thing, some of you may be wondering, where's the pre-note? What happened to that thing? So uh, I just want to encourage you, don't miss Trivia Night. There will be a special surprise there. Um, and finally, I would like to welcome the community working group up to the stage to present the Aaron Winborn Award.
here. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. Hi there. So uh, my name is George Demet. I'm the chair of the uh, Drupal Community Working Group, and I'm here today with the fellow working group members, uh, Mike Anello, Jordana Fung, and Alex Burrows. Uh, so we're a group of volunteers whose job it is to foster a friendly and welcoming environment for the Drupal project and to uphold the Drupal Code of Conduct. We do this by helping resolve conflicts between community members, as well as providing resources, consultation, and advice uh, and recognizing and supporting effective and inclusive community leadership. Um, in short, we do whatever we can to help improve the health of the community. Alex? We're here today to give out this year's Aaron Winborn Award, which is named after a long-time Drupal contributor who lost his battle with ALS in 2015. The award recognizes an individual who, like Aaron, demonstrates personal integrity, kindness, and an above and beyond commitment to the Drupal project and community. Because of his work on Drupal Media, as well as humility, generosity, and enthusiasm, Aaron's contributions continue to touch us all. The CWG accepts nominations from the community, and we vote on them as a group together with past winners, which include Kathy Tice, Gabber Hodge, Nikki Stevens, and Kevin Thal. This year, 18 individuals were nominated for the award. And over the next few weeks, we'll be contacting everyone who was nominated to let them know about the, the value um, and how much they are valued in the community. So in addition to public recognition, the award includes a scholarship and stipend to, include, uh, to attend DrupalCon this year. And also, this year, it includes a handmade piece of art <laughs> made by our own community liaison, Rachel. All right, so I get the fun part. So this year's winner is someone whose contributions have helped create a more welcoming and inclusive community. So please join me in thanking and welcoming to the stage Leslie Glynn. So now we get to watch Leslie stand by while I say nice things about her. <laughs> so Leslie has over 30 years experience in the software development field and has been working with Drupal since 2011. She has been involved in Drupal project management, site building, and client support. Within the community, she has organized and mentored Drupal sprints, has offered trainings at Drupal camps and Drupal cons, and has volunteered at, as well as helped organize many camps um, around the United States, especially near her home base in Boston. Multiple people nominated Leslie for, for this award this year. One of them wrote, and I'm quoting, uh, if you have ever attended a North American DrupalCon, Bad Camp, Nice Camp, Ned Camp, Design for Drupal, or any other major North American Drupal event, then you have seen Leslie. She is a constant inspiration of how our community and each one of us should work and act. Another one of her nominators wrote, Leslie is a dependable, passionate, kind, and giving individual, and the Drupal community is extremely fortunate to have her. I've been lucky enough to know Leslie the majority of my time um, that I've been in the Drupal community. And I'm honestly hard pressed to think of an event where I've seen Leslie where she isn't volunteering in some form or fashion. She sets a great example for all of us that volunteering just a little bit can make a huge difference. So it's for this reason that we are proud to present Leslie with the 2019 Aaron Winborn Award. Thank you all so much. There's never in a million years 
Um, did I ever think that I'd be standing up here receiving this great honor? Uh, it would be much more comfortable standing at the back door back there, counting people coming in to the, to the uh, keynote today. Um, but thank you to all the wonderful people in the community that helped me over the years learn how to be a good community member, all the past volunteers, camp organizers, DrupalCon organizers, uh, everybody that's helped me out. Um, I want to uh, say one quick word. I was lucky enough to be at DrupalCon, I mean, I'm sorry, at NICE Camp at the UN in 2013 when Aaron Winborn uh, was able to give the keynote speech. Aaron was in a wheelchair. He was using assistive technology, um, but he still spoke to, the, spoke to the audience, told them about the media module, how proud he was of all the volunteers that helped. And now we're proud of all the volunteers that have helped now and bring that into core. He'd be so proud of everybody that helped out with that. Um, also, Aaron spoke about, he was in a wheelchair. He was using assistive technology. But he spoke about how he wasn't able to work anymore and how disappointed he was in that, but how he was still going to stay in the issue queue and, and continue contributing back to the Drupal community. And that was very inspirational for me and for a lot of other people that were fortunate enough to hear him speak that year. So volunteering has been my way of giving back to the Drupal community. Um, it's given me back so much more than I have ever given to the community. So thank you again to everybody. Um, and as you continue this week, uh, just be nice to everybody like Aaron was, say hello. You know, reach out to somebody at a lunch table that's alone and I'll go back to your communities and just volunteer and help out. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you to the CWG for uh, organizing these awards and honoring um, some of our most amazing volunteers. Um, I'd now like to welcome up Lynn Capozzi from Acquia to introduce our keynote speaker today. Thanks, Tim. Good morning. Morning, DrupalCon. Congratulations to Leslie. Well done. Congratulations. So I'm excited to be here today. As I was thinking about this yesterday, uh, my first DrupalCon actually was in 2009, for those of you who may remember, in Washington, DC. So what a quick 10 years it has been. So absolutely thrilled to be here today. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer um, from Acquia. And thank you for those of you who were able to join us last night at the Acquia party. Hope everyone had a good time. And who knew how many great ping pong players we have in the crowd. So congratulations to the ping pong, ping pong winners. So I am not a developer, but I am a marketer. And I've spent a long time marketing Drupal um, and Acquia. And at Acquia, I've had a great opportunity to work with so many different organizations, large ones, small ones, all different industries, who have really seen their businesses change based on Drupal and really have great business impact from using Drupal. My personal favorite I want to share is um, an application that's been doing some great work from the folks back home for me at Boston Children's Hospital. They have a Drupal application called Open Pediatrics, and I can personally say that this particular Drupal application is a training vehicle for doctors, for nurses, for researchers, and for caregivers, and around the world, I know that it has saved, at a minimum, hundreds of children's lives. So for me, it's a great opportunity to say thank you to you for helping to make that happen. Okay, what's going on at Acquia? Just my quick commercial, so bear with me. So if you haven't seen us lately or you haven't talked to us lately, please come by our booth. We have a lot of new things that are going on. We make the best personalization product with Drupal ever. So you can come see in our booth Lyft 4.0. You can hear the story of Wendy's and how they're personalizing all around fries and burgers and Baconators. So it's a really kind of cool story. Um, so please come by. You can also kind of hear what we're doing in terms of lightning. Um, we have a couple of presentations um, from Aquians throughout the couple of days. I just want to talk about a couple of them. One which I would invite you to come see is shockingly fast site development with lightning. So that's one that you might want to participate in. This is one of my personal favorites. 
unpacking a personalized experience. And so this is a great opportunity here from both a developer and a marketer all around personalization using Lyft and with Drupal. Um, and you'll hear from kind of both sides, the marketer and the developer and working together in terms of a great personalization story. We do have uh, a raffle um, at the booth if you want to come by and participate. One thing that we're doing this year is we decided um, not to give out tchotchkes, but instead what we're doing, for every person that comes to our booth, we're donating $5 to the Girls Who Code organization. Thank you. We thought that was a good decision as well, so I'm glad that, I'm glad that you support that. So come by our booth, and I want to give as much money as possible to Girls Who Code. So a lot going on. Again, please come by. The other thing that we have, which is brand new for us, is we, we actually are previewing at our booth the Acquia Developer Studio. It's brand new. It's designed to save development time and effort in terms of building Drupal applications very quickly. So please come by. If you come by the booth, you'll actually get early access to the Developer Studio code. So you'll be able to write there if you want to. You'll be able to use that and access it. So please come by. Um, we have a great presentation that's happening on that. So I have the great pleasure of introducing Dries uh, for the Dries note this morning. We all know he's Belgian born. He's the founder of Drupal, the pioneer of open source. In Dries's keynote this morning, he has some great announcements that he'll be making. He'll talk a lot about the road to Drupal 9. And one of the things that I think is equally as important, the road to Drupal 9, is kind of what happens between now and then. So he'll be spending some time on that. And as always, he'll update beyond the code, talking about community values and principles to life and the efforts to promote Drupal to the world. So it's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce the founder of Drupal, the founder and CTO of Acquia, and my friend, Dries. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Leslie, congratulations on your award. I was actually crying as I was listening to your story and <clears throat> still emotional about it, apparently. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Tim Lennon actually talked um, about, um, you know, as part of his intro, he talked a little bit about diversity and inclusion. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that today um, as well. Um, and so, not too long ago, I actually had a conversation with the Drupal diversity and inclusion uh, leadership team, part of that team. And they actually said something to me that was really profound for me. You know, it got me thinking. And I've been thinking about it since. And it's kind of special in a way because I've been doing open source for 20 years, right? And so they told me something that kind of changed my mind about um, open source or a part of, a part of open source. Right? And so I wanted to kick off my keynote uh, with that topic before I get into some of the, the product updates. And so what they told me is that diversity in open source is actually much worse than diversity in the technology sector. Um, and maybe to some of you, that isn't a huge surprise. But for me, it was you know, kind of new. And so if you look at some of the data, you can see it on the screen. You know, in technology, generally, one out of five developers aren't men. But in open source, it's actually much worse. You know, only one in 20 identify um, as not male. And so seeing these statistics, you know, obviously makes me wonder how we're doing in Drupal, and we don't have good data. But regardless, uh, clearly, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, in this area. Um, and so the question then is, like, why is it so much worse in open source? You know, and there's obviously a lot of different factors to this. Uh, but one of the factors is the issue of time, right? And so there are systemic issues that basically negatively affect underrepresented groups. For example, women still today often spend double the amount of time doing unpaid domestic work. Or, you know, in certain racial um, groups, there's serious wage gaps. And it affects how much these people can contribute, right? Some of them have to work more hours. Some of them have to work maybe two or three jobs to provide for their families. And it's preventing them from contributing um, as much as maybe other people can, or prevent them from contributing at all. And so the issue of time 
is, you know, a big issue, right? Free time um, to contribute to open source is a privilege. And I used to believe, you know, I used to say, I used to write about this actually, I used to say that everybody could contribute to Drupal. That the only thing that you needed was a willingness to learn. And so today, obviously, looking at this data, talking to different people about this, I've come to realize that that is not true. That open source isn't actually a meritocracy because not everybody has free time. And so I believe that we have an obligation to try and do something about that, especially those that have time. You know, we can do something about this today because um, everybody deserves the opportunity to contribute. Um, obviously, we can't change all of this overnight. Like, we can't fix years and years of systemic issues and societal issues, but there are things that are in our control as individuals, and there are things that are in our control as organizations that we can start changing today, right? So before I go there, let's talk a little bit about why this matters. Because there's a lot of reasons why diversity and inclusion are a great thing. Some of you may be skeptical in the room, I don't know. Um, but just a few examples. Um, as you probably know, Drupal is used roughly by one out of 30 websites in the world. What that means is that we serve billions of people, right? If you think about this notion, like if you visit more than 30 websites, on average, you'll have hit a Drupal site. Most people visit more than 30 websites. And so basically, we almost touch everybody um, in the world. And these people that we touch with Drupal, they are very diverse. And so the best way to build software for all these people is to be diverse ourselves as a community of contributors. Right? That's the best way we can do it. And for those that contribute to Drupal Core, you know, we do have people, like we have blind people contributing to Drupal Core. And it's been amazing because it actually helped us build better software. Right, so think about that example and how do we apply that to everything we do. Um, and this is not just me saying this, this is backed up by a lot of research, Harvard did research on this, all of these organizations. Um, another organization, McKinsey, um, they said that diversity improves collaboration because it actually reduces bias, it reduces groupthink, it helps organizations deal with conflict much better. It's also proven that it unlocks innovation and creativity. When people feel welcomed and people feel safe and comfortable, they're much more willing to share ideas, to propose ideas. And I've experienced that myself um, you know, in various organizations and groups. Like if you feel comfortable, you're much more willing to share. And so these are just a few examples um, of why diversity and inclusion matters. Obviously, it's not only good for our community, but it's also good for all the people that we touch with this, right? So there's many, many reasons why we want to do this. Um, and so those that have time to contribute, we should really try and make an offer, effort to welcome um, other people in the community. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can intentionally try to welcome people. You can mentor people um, from underrepresented groups when they ask you to. And you can also make space if you're in a community organizing rule or an event organizing rule. You can make space to give them time to present or lead sprints, these kinds of things. The things that we're starting to do or have been doing now for several years with the Drupal Association. And a few weeks ago, I was um, you know, reading up on issues in the, in the issue queue and I came across this um, code review from uh, Gnuget, I think it's pronounced. Um, but what was amazing about his review was the kindness and how helpful he was. And I was literally blown away by this comment. And so it was a great example of how many of us can um, behave in the issue queue. And this is really important because other research, research from GitHub has shown that one out of five people who experience negative behavior when contributing to open source, actually stop contributing at all, right? So imagine how many people you can lose uh, and how quickly you can lose uh, many great contributors. So um, this is something that you know, all of us can always be you know, aware of. Organizations 
can also do a lot of things. Obviously, you can pay your employees to contribute. So people don't have to work at night or on the weekend. You can pay them full time. You can pay them part time. You can also donate to different programs um, that allow others to contribute. So these are just some of the things um, that you can do in, as an organization. Of course, Drupal itself doesn't sit still. We're constantly looking to do more things to improve our own diversity and inclusion. Um, we've extended the commit credits to include non-code contributions. That's been huge. Um, we have updated the gender field on Drupal.org to, to not be a binary field so people can choose um, from more options uh, and self-identify. We keep updating and tweaking our code of conduct, our terms of services. Um, we've expanded our Drupal uh, scholarship program. Tim talked a little bit about that. Um, and as Tim also talked about, we keep increasing the diversity of our speakers. Um, not only is half of the speakers from unrepresented groups, but almost 40% are also first-time speakers, which is a great statistic as well. Obviously, education and open dialogue are very important, so we have a lot of sessions about this as well, and you can go watch um, some of these sessions today. These are just the sessions today about diversity and inclusion. So I encourage all of you to attend those, um, especially if you wouldn't otherwise have chosen to attend one of those sessions. Um, so with that, I want to progress into um, sort of the next section. So we have a lot of people contributing to Drupal, many of whom are here today. And together, we're one of the largest and most thriving open source community in the, in, communities in the world, right? And so we should lead by example. Uh, we have over 1,000 organizations contributing to Drupal. I mean, it's like a, it's a massive number if you think about it. Like, how many other open source projects have thousands of people? Um, we have companies like Pfizer, who are leading a core initiative around workflows. Um, we have companies like Hook42, and they wrote the book on Drupal 7 Multilingual. They're also sponsoring the Simply Test.me testing infrastructure. Um, One X Internet, they co-organized Drupal Europe and you know, employ a Drupal Association board member. Uh, Third and Grove, they're sponsoring a full-time core committer. Uh, Drut, they sponsored the creation of a sort of a sprint kit, uh, which is used to you know, mentor and onboard you know, new contributors in our community. Um, Thunder was building a distribution for media websites. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So many great contributors. There's also over 10,000 individual contributors to Drupal. Again, you know, this makes us one of the largest open source communities in the world. Um, people like Asgar, who are promoting Drupal in um, Pakistan as a way to make a living uh, for those with limited resources. It's an amazing story. Uh, Fatima, uh, part of the Drupal diversity and inclusion leadership team. She's also working on governance. She's also contributing fixes to Drupal core, uh, contributes in many ways. Uh, Narcisse was doing Drupal trainings in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, he's been doing that for many, many years. Um, Jesus, who creates the Drupal console project, which is used by many. Punam, who has led multiple trainings and also led 50 women in technology trainings in India. I mean, these are just some amazing stories, and I can keep going and going and going. Um, but together, as a community of people all around the world, organizations all around the world, we've made some amazing progress in the last six months since my previous Dries note. And so I want to give you a quick update on all of the progress that we've made. First of all, Drupal 8 uh, you know, keeps on growing. We have 35% more Drupal 8 sites compared to a year ago. Um, the platform is also really stable because we have almost 50% you know, more stable Drupal 8 modules compared to a year ago, which is really fantastic news for those that are looking to migrate to Drupal 8 and may not have been able to yet because some of the modules weren't ready. So more and more modules are getting ready and getting very, ready very quickly. We're also less than three weeks away 
from launching 8.7, which is going to be a fantastic release. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. So at Drupal Europe, the previous conference uh, introduced this kind of mountain slide, you know, which is um, representing the Drupal 8 product strategy. It's like, where do we want to go from a product point of view? And so I'm going to use this framework in this presentation again to help you understand the progress we've made and where we want to go next. So first, I'd like to talk about the first strategic track, which is to make Drupal easy for content creators and site builders. Right? And you can see some of the initiatives that we have uh, on this track. And then for each of the initiatives, by the way, we have roadmaps and plans. And so it's kind of like, you know, it cascades down. Um, so first, um, let's look at um, layout. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to show you a video of the progress we've made in the layout builder. This video actually will use Umami, which is another initiative. So it's kind of nice to see um, those initiatives work together, if you will. So I'm going to hit play, and we're going to watch it together, and then we'll talk about it. Umami is a website with recipes. One of Umami's recipes was just featured on a TV show. Because the featured recipe is getting so much traffic from people who are watching the TV show, we want to take advantage of that. We don't have time to involve our development team. It's too slow. As an Umami editor, I've been tasked with creating and adding a new banner on the recipe page that links to a special offer. I'll use the layout builder to do this. This banner is new content that doesn't exist elsewhere on the site. So I start by creating a new block and entering the content. Since I'm using Layout Builder, I immediately get a preview of what the banner will look like. It looks good, but I think it would be better to replace the existing image with the new banner. So I delete the old image, and using Layout Builder's drag and drop, I can move the new banner into the place that the old image was in. It can be cumbersome to move large items like this, so I use the Toggle Preview checkbox to show small textual representations of the block instead. This makes it very easy and fast to move things. Alternatively, I could use the keyboard or screen reader to navigate and use the layout builder because it conforms to web content accessibility guidelines recommended by the World Wide Web Consortium. This means it's accessible for everyone. If you are a keyboard user, it's actually very fast. In this example, the block is being moved using only the keyboard. The Layout Builder supports all the basic use cases that you've come to expect, but it also supports more complex workflows. For example, you can send layouts through a staging or approval workflow. As such, this recipe has remained unchanged throughout this editing process. Now that I'm happy with the way the page looks, I can publish it right from the same interface. Staging layouts is not something that many systems support, but Drupal's Layout Builder does. In this example, we showed a fairly simple workflow, but because it leverages Drupal's powerful workflow engine, it can handle very advanced workflows too. I now see my new banner on the published page, and it looks fantastic. As you can see, I was able to add a banner in just a few minutes, and with Drupal's workflow integration, I was able to do that safely. No need to involve our developers. Yeah. Next, let's look at another There's more. <laughs> Instead of editing the layout of a single page, let's edit the layout of a collection of pages. This is particularly useful for large sites with hundreds or thousands of pages. Umami did a usability study on its recipe pages, and one of the takeaways was that users get confused with the white space below the image. The UX and design teams have recommended that we display the recipe information next to each other rather than stack below each other. We have hundreds of recipes on our website, and it would be very tedious to update them one by one. Fortunately, I can use Layout Builder to update all recipe layouts at once by modifying the default layout for all recipes. Here we are looking at the layout template for a recipe. I've added a new four column region in between the image and the ingredients, and now I can drag and drop each of the recipe quick stats into those columns.
After saving the new default layout, I go to my content list page, click on a random recipe, and I can see that the new layout has been applied. Much better. Being able to edit templated layouts like this is a powerful differentiator from other layout builders. And it's a huge time saver for sites with lots of content. There we go. In some amazing work, I actually do believe we leapfrogged the comp competition with this. You know, because not only what you just saw, not only can we support basic case use cases, like maybe, you know, one-off pages, but we can also support all of these advanced use cases now, um, like templated layouts, like you saw, or these layout workflows. I mean, these are things that are not available in our competitors' layout building tools. The fact that the layout builder is accessible is huge, too. You know, and you guys saw that, but that's a big deal and something that we should all be very, very proud of. It was hard work, um, but we did it. And the good news is that this will ship with 8.7 in three weeks. And it, yeah, that's awesome. Um, in total, 123 people contributed to this. And I can tell you from spending time with them, or some of them, not all 123, but some of the bigger names on this screen, they worked weekends, they worked nights, they gave up vacation days to get this table for 8.7. Like, this team deserves a big round of applause. About 68 organizations uh, supported many of these individual contributors, so also let's give them an applause as well. Next, I'm going to talk about the Layout uh, Builder and the Layout Initiative, which originally was started by Aaron, um, as Leslie mentioned. And so I have a video about that as well. I'm going to play it now. Here at Umami, we have the ability to display additional related photos and videos at the bottom of our articles on our site. We use Drupal 8's media library, which makes it really easy to create and reuse multiple kinds of media. As an Umami editor, I was tasked with adding some mushroom photos to the end of an article about mushrooms. This is where the media library comes in handy. I can edit the article, scroll to the bottom, and click the Add Media button. The media library opens, and I can see media used elsewhere on the site. One of the existing images is of a mushroom, so I go ahead and select that. I want more than one photo, though, so I'll upload a few more. I can upload as many files at once as I need to, so I choose three images of mushrooms. Once they're done uploading, I notice that one of them isn't a mushroom. That's okay though, because it's easy to remove that item before saving. Once I enter any required fields, metadata in this case, I can save and immediately insert the new media into the field. But I choose save and select because I want to add more media. This field allows images and remote video, so I see a tab for each of these media types. I switch to the remote video tab and paste a URL for a video hosted on Vimeo. I now see both my images and video in the widget where I can rearrange them to my liking. Once happy, I save the article and scroll down to see my additional media displayed as I would expect. Awesome, huh? This, yeah. A lot of what you saw is stable, and this, the initiative actually made more progress than, uh, you know, in, in the last six months than maybe in previous uh, six months uh, chunks. So they've really accelerated their progress. Uh, some of these things are stable, some of them are experimental, and some of them are still in progress. The biggest thing we probably have to do is have the WYSIWYG integration, um, you know, so they can easily embed. Uh, images or videos um, from within, you know, the WYSIWYG tool in Drupal. So we'll keep working on that. Hopefully we can target that for 8.8, .8, which will be roughly six months uh, from today. Um, in total, 310 people, individuals, have come together uh, to make this happen, which is a crazy number. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
and 122 organizations have given many of these people time to work on that. So. All right, next I want to talk a little bit about the Administration UI, which is a newer initiative. Um, but last year, I spent a lot of time actually talking to not just users, but also uh, Drupal agency owners. Um, and so one of the biggest items of feedback that they gave me is that it can be hard to sell Drupal, between quotes, um, because, that, because the UI looked a little bit dated. And they would tell me, like, you know, end users, customers, potential customers, they're looking at more modern experience. Um, and so we decided to start this initiative. Uh, and it's really important, right? Because I, I do think a lot of people, when they look something that looks a little bit dated, they make assumptions about how the technology actually is under the hood. But the reality is Drupal is really awesome under the hood. We're just not good at showing it off through our UI. Um, it's also not a surprise that it does look a little bit dated because if you think about it, we started working on the current UI maybe almost 10 years ago when we started working on Drupal 7. And while we've made updates to it, we haven't really kind of done a major uh, refresh. And so I believe it's holding back Drupal's growth. Uh, and so we decided to make it a priority. And so the team's actually done a great job um, you know, making progress. And they came up with mockups and style guides and, and all of these things. They've done usability testing. You can see some of the before and after here. It might be a little bit too small. Um, but the summary of it is that it does look a lot more modern. It feels a lot more modern. Um, there's actually much better use of space. Uh, it has better accessibility. You know, it's better because it has more contrast. It has more space to click uh, all of these things. And so pretty excited about this. We don't quite know when it will be ready, but we're hoping to target 8.8 or 8.9, uh, which could actually be great timing because it's getting close to the release of Drupal 9, and it would give Drupal 9 sort of a, you know, a fresh coat of paint, if you will. Um, this is an initiative where we'd love to get more help. I mean, it shouldn't, I mean, a lot of you are experts <laughs> in front-end development, and so we would love to get more people involved so we can get it done sooner than later. So if you're looking for ways to contribute, this would be a great, uh, a great area. Uh, I'll talk more about the contributors once it's actually in core. Um, so I, hopefully next time I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. And so that's really the first kind of track, you know, to make Drupal easy for content creators and site builders. And it's important, right? Because for Drupal to be successful, we need to be successful with every persona. It's no longer enough to just win the hearts and minds of developers. We need to succeed with the marketers and the content creators, the people actually, you know, the people spending like up to eight hours a day in Drupal, creating content, managing content. Um, and the benefits are huge because it allows those organizations to be more cost efficient. They have to rely less on developers to get certain things done. And this is important for organizations small and large. You know, this helps the very small nonprofits um, and it also helps the large enterprises. And arguably, it will help the small non nonprofits much more than the large enterprises. So very exciting work. Um, I didn't talk about the workflow initiative here, but they've also continued to make progress. Uh, more things have become revisionable, like menus and taxonomy terms. And so lots of great work on that initiative as well. So shout out to them. So that's the first track. Let's talk about the second track. Um, the second track is to make Drupal easy to evaluate and adopt. And we've done a lot of great work on this. You may remember from previous keynotes where I showed like all of the steps it takes to install Drupal. It was, I forgot the number, but it was 50 plus, I think. And we brought it down to like three steps or one step, very small number of steps. Um, but that team continues to make improvements. Um, we've also made a lot of improvements on Migrate. Um, so Migrate and Migrate API are the tools that organizations use to migrate from, say, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, or from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8, or even from another platform uh, to Drupal 8. Uh, and one of the key people on that initiative is a quiet one, you know, Vicky. And so um, she's a long-term contributor 
contributor of Drupal. She's been very passionate about open source. She actually won the New Zealand Open Source Award last year, which is really cool. And so I had a chance to interview her um, all the way you know, in New Zealand. I didn't go to New Zealand, <laughs> but uh, through um, a Google Hangout. And so I'm gonna play a little video, a little video interview with Vicky right now. So when I look back at what I've started working in migration, this was back in 8.0, I started writing migration tests as my starting point. And I have found that the tests I wrote then and the ones I write now are largely the same. So that proves the API is doing its job, you're doing it well. What has changed are some of the development tools that makes it easier. We have more specifics like process plugins that allow us to do a bit more and to cover a few more edge cases, that kind of thing. And over time in the contrib community as well, the tools have expanded and grown to cover more, to, to fix bugs, that kind of stuff. So we started out with a good base and over time it just gets more robust each time, each iteration. And um, in the sense it's more complete because we're covering more of those edge cases and getting wider out and farther out can handle. Different sources of CSV, JSON, et cetera, et cetera, are all handled. Of course, we claimed ourselves stable in 8.5. So from there on, it's been, again, just building on that base, adding bug fixes, edge cases. So there's really, since 8.5, there's no reason that people should hold back on migrating. It's certainly ready to migrate and, and ready to migrate now. Waiting for Drupal 9 will not assist the migration process. There are a few edge cases that still need to be finished off per, primarily with multilingual. And for those cases as well, I would say you, you should start your migration now. Come talk to us on Migrate Slack or look at the issues to see where you fit in the edge cases. Many multilingual sites have already migrated. And if you're not one of those edge cases, then please begin your migration. Yeah. For those of you that follow the commit stream, if you will, of all of the code changes to Drupal, there's not a week that goes by without several commits or improvements to the Migrate API. And so if you have looked at migrating uh, to Drupal 8, um, you know, maybe a year, two years ago, have a look again, because the tools have really advanced. So between the module readiness that I showed earlier and the maturity and the progress on the Migrate API, you know, do check again because, you know, we should be a lot more ready uh, for you to migrate today. Um, mentioned the out-of-the-box initiative. Um, that initiati initiative is actually completed. They completed its goals, I should say, yeah. Um, but they've also been making more progress. Like, they're not, they're completed their goals, but they're continuing to make it better, uh, which, is, which is really awesome. They have added a Spanish translation, and they did that in, like, no time which is a great testament to Drupal's multilingual capabilities. They added a welcome tour to improve the accessibility um, of the um, you know, Umami um, initiative and the theme, uh, and many, many more things. And so it's really exciting to see this uh, get better and better as well. Um, 187 people contributed to this. Yeah, it's amazing. And behind them, or behind many of them, there is 86 organizations. As you can see, a lot of volunteer contributions here. So obviously, this is really important, um, you know, especially the out of the box, because um, it makes it easier for organizations and individuals to discover and learn Drupal. And instead of, instead of having to go through all of these steps uh, before you have a functional Drupal site that shows the power of Drupal, you can now get there in just you know, 30 seconds and a few steps. Um, and so that's good for sort of the grassroots adoption of Drupal, if you will, because people can do that themselves. But it's also really good uh, for digital agencies, you know, organizations that need to demo Drupal to a potential Drupal customer or potential Drupal user. And so you can use this to help sell Drupal. Um, and so I think that's fantastic that we've made this much progress and that with uh, 8.7, that's really ready to go. So great job for all the people involved with that. So the next track is to make, um, 
it, it's kind of a, you know, there's different things in this track, but it's to make Drupal more relevant and to increase the impact of Drupal. And the item that I want to talk about here is uh, API first, because we've spent a lot of time talking about the six month feature releases uh, previously, and I'll touch upon that again later. But uh, we achieved a major, major milestone for the API first initiative, and that's that JSON API got committed to Drupal 8.7. Um, yeah. It will be stable, so it's shipping as a stable module in just three weeks. Um, and it's, it's really um, very important, I think, for Drupal's relevance uh, for, the, for many, many years to come. Um, what it allows you to do, for those that are not familiar, it allows you to get content, such as articles, in and out of Drupal in um, a programmatic way through, West, through web services, like you can see on the screen. And so that's really useful when you're building a mobile application or a single page JavaScript application or maybe when you want to push content to a digital kiosk or any kind of channel or platform or device. Um, Drupal's JSON API implementation is extremely complete. It respects all of the permissions in Drupal. It supports reading and writing content. It plays nice with Drupal's versioning and translations. Um, and can literally be used for any piece of content in Drupal. It's probably the most complete implementation of JSON API in the world. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, and it leverages, it builds on years and years of work. And it leverages the Entity API, the Field API, the Access API, the Configuration and Type Data APIs, and much more. And so it's deeply integrated, it's robust, it's not sort of slapped on, you know. It's really in Drupal and goes to the core of Drupal. Um, and that's super important because it extends our leadership in API first. You know, there's a large competitor that we have. Their name starts with an A and ends with B. <laughs> and they just announced um, GraphQL support like a few weeks ago. And not like they released it a few weeks ago. They announced it to be released like later this year. <laughs> and so think about Drupal. We've had GraphQL for years. We've had JSON API for years. And now we're shipping with JSON API out of the box for every site to use just in three weeks. Um, and the impact of this work uh, will be big, right? It will really help set up Drupal for success in the next five to 10 years because it helps with different front-end applications, but it also helps with back-end integrations. Um, and so the use cases are pretty vast. Um, and as you can see in this slide, we support all of the different configurations that you can think of, uh, which is pretty exciting. 146 people worked on this, and they've worked on JSON API specifically for two years. This is the result of two years of hard work. It was all started by Matteo, and then uh, Wim and Gabe um, really jumped in as well. And so the three of them, I would say, did an amazing job pushing this over the finish line. A lot of organizations were behind this as well, which was great to see. So thanks to those organizations too. All right, so that's that track. The last track I want to talk about here um, is sort of the green track which is about reducing total cost of ownership for developers and site owners. And there's a lot of different things on this track. And we've made progress on almost all of those things. But I also believe there is more we need to do on this track. Right? I feel like as we kind of complete a lot of our goals on the other tracks, we need to focus or refocus some of our efforts on this track. Uh, because it's really important for Drupal. Um, you know, growing adoption is a priority for us and making it easier and cheaper for individuals and organizations to use Drupal uh, is pretty important. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And I want to dive into this track and I want to touch upon two different things. One is the upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, and then is the upgrade from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, all right? So let's start with 7 to 8. So first question is, how many of you are still on Drupal 7 or maybe have a customer that's, that's still on Drupal 7. 
All right, that's a lot of you, right? So no surprise there. <laughs> uh, and so it's something that we need to talk about. First of all, no panic, because Drupal 7 is actually still community supported for two years and seven months. Two years and seven months. And after that, a number of vetted vendors will continue to provide support for at least three more years. Right? So that will be commercial support. Um, but support will be available for three more years. And so that means that Drupal 7 is supported for at least like another five years. At least another five years, which is, in my conversations, a lot of people don't realize that. They feel like they need to move off immediately. <laughs> now, um, let's talk a little bit more about that. So trying to, we try to figure out like what's a good kind of like <laughs> analogy that we can use here. But one of the challenges that we've had in the past is like when a major version goes end of life, you kind of need to change tracks. You know, you need to get on the next track. And it's not as simple as getting up the train and getting into the other train. It's maybe it feels a little bit more like actually moving the train, <laughs> not just the passengers, right? It can be hard because you have to um, rewrite custom code because we made API changes. You have to actually migrate your content you know, from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And depending on your situation, that can be hard uh, or it can be relatively easy too. But um, especially for large organizations, large websites, this can be pretty hard. Um, now, a lot of organizations are starting to migrate now. I hear more and more organizations that are starting to migrate. And I have two examples of that. And I decided to focus on complex organizations because that's where most of the, most of the pain is. And so the first organization I want to talk about is the uh, state of Georgia. And Nikhil, who is the chief digital officer, is going to talk a little bit in the next video about their experience moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So I'm Nikhil Deshpande. I'm the chief digital officer for the state of Georgia. And I head the digital services team. My team works with state agencies and elected officials. And we host all of their sites um, on a Drupal platform. Uh, we have been using Drupal 7 since um, 2011. Uh, we have a digital platform that hosts about 110 websites as of this day, making sure the content is well served from an agency perspective to our citizens, which is Georgia's population is about 10.5 million. Um, so we have a pretty decent traffic hitting this platform in um, all of the 110 websites. Um, so the decision to move to Drupal 8 was not that easy because Drupal 8 was so different from 7. And also when we invest in a large project, we have to show you know, the, the rationale behind it. But as we started learning more about Drupal 8, you know, it really met the overall digital strategy and the requirements that we had set for the state, which is you know, we already have a federated model with Georgia Gov bubbling up content from uh, agency websites. For example, JSON API, that service we basically can now connect websites and share content across each other. Accessibility, for example, for us is, is non-negotiable as government. Like we have to make sure we comply to a certain level of accessibility. So having known that Drupal 8 in its core itself had you know, the accessibility enhancements was a great knowledge to have and um, also use, user experience in, in general. Like I saw that it was mobile first and it's basic build which is great because like our mobile traffic has been like skyrocketing for the last few years anyways. And also seeing that the responsiveness of uh, Drupal 8 also seeped into the back end uh, editorial experience as well, because we have editors uh, updating content using several devices. I think overall, like just the fact that the core was better inclusive of modules and the uh, dependency on Contrib, again, you know, which is great. We love Contrib uh, modules, but that was also really good that it was a where you know well-rounded solution for us um, to begin with and last but not the least the community you know the community is growing we have more uh, and more partners and you know in, individual contributors I think the community really kind of it was the, like the last piece where like you know the health of it uh, made us decide to move to Drupal 8. Yeah as far as contributing back is concerned I and mean, then the whole idea for us to implement open source was the whole contribution aspect of the community comes together and makes this a better product. 
So I think it is our responsibility to make sure if we do something, it needs to go back to the community. So we have done that with uh, Drupal 7, but as we were working on even Drupal 8, we only selected partners you know, that have done a significant role and job of contributing back. And that was like one of our selection criteria, to be honest with you. But so far we have about uh, 36 patches contributed back. I want to say we are working on making sure that we contribute some of the updates to the media module. And I think we have block blacklist um, contributed back so far. And again, you know, we, as we go and work more on our platform, we will be contributing back. But I'm really happy that we have done that so far. And the fact that everything that we are building, we are building from a mindset of contributing it back to the community. Awesome, yeah. There's, a, there's a, a lot of different things that I like about this video. One, it's honest. You know, they said it's hard, but it was worth it. I hope, I hope you heard that in the video. I also like that they're contributing back. And I also like that they said, um, you know, we like to work with partners that contribute back. And I've heard that from others, and I, I talked about that last time using Pfizer as an example. They've learned that working with agencies that contribute back gives better results because chances of them really knowing what they're doing is much higher, right? And so a couple of great anecdotes there. Um, Nikhil and the team, or maybe not all of the team, are actually here this week. And so I'm sure you can go ask them questions if you're thinking about migrating from uh, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Um, I have one more video. Um, that's the example of Pega, which is a large technology company, publicly traded company. Uh, and so they also shared their experience going from 7 to Drupal 8. So I'll play that now. We were looking at something that was Herculean. We understood the complexities and we saw how challenging the road was. Six months. We just had six months to get to MVP. A complete replatform and redesign of the website. And for extra credit, we decided to integrate with our own Pegas CRM product and implement an atomic design system. Yeah, piece of cake, right? <laughs> I like cake. And it was the best choice we could have made. The plan was to move our two core digital properties to Drupal 8, properties that receive millions of visitors. Our digital presence needs to support the business in going after our biggest strategic problems and solving them. These are moving targets. We need to get the most velocity we can from running a portfolio of 10 distinct websites through one technical platform. The first thing we realized was that we couldn't swallow this whale hole. We needed to have smaller, bite-sized chunks that we could work with, so we ran D7 and D8 sites in parallel until fully migrated. So we adopted an agile methodology, hired a scrum master, and packed on some PM and business analyst muscle. Done, right? No, not even close. The second thing we realized is that we couldn't do this alone. We're about as far from a vanilla migration as possible. So we brought in partners to augment our staff in key areas. We had thousands of pages of content, all needed to be migrated to new templates. We had many complex integrations, including analytics, multi-language, federated search. Goodbye beans, hello paragraphs. And we gave back to the community. There are a lot of really talented folks out there, and they supported us during some of our most difficult challenges. Looking back, I think this was a case that the mountain looks a lot steeper than it is. And yeah, sure, some of the train was a tough go. But we did it and it feels great. Our websites are faster and much easier to maintain and theme. They're clean, well-architected. They make the job of our developers much easier. Drupal 8's content authoring cuts our self-service time down by a third, making it much more efficient for our content authors. In reality, we didn't have a choice. We've got to keep pace with the evolutionary needs of our organization, and we see the switch to Drupal 8 as a generational improvement it's the kind of thing I encourage everyone to just jump into. Did I answer your question? Oh, right. Would I migrate to Drupal 8 again? Yes, but just not today, OK? Yeah. <laughs> that was a good video. It's a funny anecdote there. Like, I, I reached out to Derek, one of the people in the in the video and said, hey, can we do an interview? Here are some of the questions I'm thinking about. Next thing I know, they came back with this video. <laughs> I 
which is amazing. So thanks for doing that. It's a great, a great video. And again, it's very honest, right? And again, you have to look at it through the right lens. This is a complex organization um, with a lot of you know, integrations. And um, they decided to do it. And they came out being very happy. You know, it's faster, it's easier. They reduced their costs, all of these things. And so there's a lot of benefits to upgrading to Drupal 8. Um, you can see some of them on the screen. Some of them were echoed by people in the video. I'm not going to go through all of them uh, here, but um, go talk to uh, you know go talk to different sponsors you know in the exhibition hall if you want to learn more about why you should migrate to Drupal 8 and why you should migrate uh, today. Last thing I want to mention, real quick, uh, again without going into the details here, is that there are tools available in the community that can help you with this migration. You know from migrating code to migrating content and data. So check out those tools if you haven't. They'll help you. And these tools keep getting better, too. So uh, another question. How many people are on 7 or have a customer on 7 and are waiting for Drupal 9? How many are going to skip a release? All right, some people. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that, because one of the things that we've changed is that once you are on the Drupal 8 track, once you move that train from the 7 to 8 track, you're going to never have to change tracks again. right? And so that's pretty powerful, because you're just going to keep the train on the track, and new releases are going to come out. And the upgrade from 8 to 9 or 9 to 10 will be easy. And so again, I speak to a lot of people that don't really understand this yet, so I wanted to reiterate that. So in conclusion here for this section, you know, it's fine to stay on 7. If you don't want to move, that's fine. It's supported for quite some time. Um, however, there are a lot of reasons to migrate to Drupal 8. And knowing that the upgrade will be easy, there's real benefits in upgrading sooner than later, because you get to take advantage of these, um, of these new features. And because you're on this one track after you upgrade to Drupal 8, there is really no reason to wait for Drupal 9, right? Because the upgrade will be easy. So let's talk a little bit about that in detail, the, the path from 8 to 9, because there's a lot of questions about that as well. And so I want to want to make sure I try and address some of that. Um, first of all, Drupal 9 will ship in like a year and two months or so. That's pretty close, right? Anyone feeling a little anxiety? <laughs> um, so most people are pretty excited here, except maybe one emoji that's a little bit more terrified. But um, <laughs> for the most part, it should be exciting. Um, the target is June 2020. However, we have the option to fall back to December 2020, just in case we need more time to prepare. Uh, but things are going really well right now. And so June 2020 looks very likely, I would say. Um, just as a reminder, there's two reasons why we need to bump the major version number from 8 to 9. One is because we use third-party dependencies, um, like a Symfony. And Symfony, we use Symfony 3 specifically, and Symfony 3 will be end of life at some point. And so we need to move to Symfony 4 or Symfony 5. And doing that migration requires us to increase our major version number because of you know, API changes. Um, but we also get all of the benefits of Symfony 4 or 5, right? So it get, gets us better um, dependencies, so to speak. And the second reason is that we need to drop deprecated code. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But um, we have a new innovation model now where we can innovate and add new features and ship new capabilities, like the ones I showed, layout and media. But to maintain backwards compatibility, you know, we do manage deprecated code. And at some point, that becomes overhead, right? And so dropping that deprecated code improves maintainability, improves performance, improves the developer experience, and so forth. So the way we innovate, as a quick reminder, because this started with Drupal 8, is that we now have major and minor and patch releases. And we do um, a minor release every six months. And 8.7 is an example of a minor release. It can come jam-packed with new features. Um, and so the way that actually works um, in a little bit more detail is um, you know, as we add new code to these releases, we may deprecate old APIs. You can sort of see that here visually on the screen. Um, and we keep doing this. Um, but at some point, 
we will have to upgrade these third-party dependencies because you know we don't want you to use insecure versions of those, right? So let's take Symphony for example. At some point, we need to go to uh, you know Symphony four or maybe Symphony five, um, and when we do that, we have to bump the release from eight point nine in this example to nine, and then we can also actually drop all of this deprecated code and sort of clean up some of our code base, and that's what we will call Drupal 9. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that Drupal 9 is basically identical to Drupal 8.9 minus the deprecated code plus the updated third-party dependencies, right? That's really what it means. And so there's not like major new things in 9 compared to 8.9. Um, and that's important because any Drupal 8 module that does not use deprecated code will continue to work with Drupal 9. Yes. <laughs> and so that means that the upgrade from 8 to 9 should be easy. All right? Um, so, um, it's kind of a big deal because, again, 7 to 8 can be pretty hard, but Drupal to, you know, 8 to 9 will be easy. Now, there's a little asterisk there. You know, you see that? <laughs> I can zoom into it. <laughs> and it's assuming no deprecated code is used by these modules. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that because the call to action that I'll get to in a few minutes is that we as a community need to start managing deprecated code well, all right? So uh, what is deprecated code? It's a good question, um, and I'll keep it fairly high level. <laughs> but here's an example of maybe something that was in Drupal uh, 8.4, file unmanaged copy. It's a function. And at some point, we decided to change it to a service model, as you can see here, right? The after looks a little bit more complex maybe, but. Uh, it had all sorts of advantages that you don't have with the original. And so we added the you know, Drupal service thing, and we deprecated the file unmanaged copy. And so what that means is that modules need to be updated. And in this case, you need to do like a search and replace, if you will, from file unmanaged copy to Drupal service, yada, yada, yada. All right, so that's an example of deprecated code. Um, and so then the question is, when Drupal 9 gets released, the original file unmanaged copy will stop working. So by the time Drupal 9 is released, you need to have done that search and replace. So that, that's kind of the idea. And so then the question is, how do I know if my site uses any deprecated code? How do I know that my site will be ready for Drupal um, 9? And so good news is there's a bunch of tools. So um, Matt Clemen from the Commerce Guys, he actually built something called Drupal Check. And you can download it and you can run it against your module. And when you do that, it will tell you all of the sort of errors that you have, meaning all of the uses of deprecated code in your module. You can see it's pretty easy. You can see, oh, line 40 of this file, I have a call. That call needs to be replaced with something else. That tool is available today, and I encourage you to use it today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, like, there's really no reason to wait for Drupal 9 to do this because, again, if you do this today and you sh change your code today, you actually get to benefit from these changes today as well, right? Because you would use the new code in Drupal 8 already. Um, I would also encourage you to integrate this tool in your developer workflows, in your automated developer workflows, so that you can always keep checking what's deprecated and what's not deprecated. Um, there's also another tool that we've been building, which is a more visual tool. Uh, it's the Upgrade Status Module. Uh, and what it does is uh, it basically will use Drupal Check, but it will scan each of your modules one by one, as you can see here. And while it's scanning, you can actually start looking at some of these error logs. And this is all from within Drupal. So if you're a site owner, maybe less technical, you can go in and check, hey, are we ready? <laughs> You can actually, from there, you can link to documentation, and you can actually see, look, deprecated on the screen. And it will tell you what to change. And so it's very easy to figure out what to change and how to change it. Um, you can export it as well, um, get a full export of all the deprecations in all 
your site's modules, you can send that to your favorite developer. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a great little tool. And so you can install it on your site. And if you're maybe less technical or, or you prefer a, you know, sort of a, a UI-based solution, you can use this to see if your site is ready. And if there's no deprecations, if there's no errors, it should mean that the upgrade is easy, right? As, assuming we can actually catch all of the deprecations. But, um, and so it's pretty cool. Um, Dwayne from uh, Pantheon actually used this tool, and he ran Drupal check against all 7,000 contributed modules. That's a fun thing to do, I bet. Um, but basically, um, we looked at that data a little bit more. Um, but basically, Dwayne said, um, I think it was 44% of those 7,000 modules, so a little bit less than half of those modules, they actually have no deprecation violations today, which means they should already be ready for Drupal 9, which is pretty good. Oh, yeah. And then you can see the orange thing, which is a little bit more than a quarter. They only, these modules have only either between one and five deprecations. They should be relatively easy to upgrade. I actually upgraded my own site, <laughs> or have some of my own modules, and it was very easy for me, um, in my case, I should say, because um, all of my deprecations were search and replace. Some of them are a little bit more involved in search and replace, but in my case, they're all search and replace, and my site was ready for Drupal 9 in 10 minutes, which is pretty cool. And then about a quarter of the modules of the 7,000 modules have five or more deprecations, all right? So they need more work. Um, and so what this all means is, um, in terms of call to action, um, you know, we should stop using deprecated code in core. And so we have a little bit more than one year to remove all of the deprecated code from all of these modules, including our own custom modules, not just the contributed modules. Um, we're also going to make Drupal 8.8 .8 the last release to deprecate code. And so it will be stable, if you will, in terms of no new deprecations being introduced. And so that allows you to kind of use six months of stableness to really get ready for Drupal uh, 9. Um, I will say that we should look at ways to expand Drupal check to also scan Twig and JavaScript, which it doesn't do today. It's focused on PHP code. So that's an area where um, we would love to get more contribution. Um, and so that's a little bit about the upgrade from 8 to 9. All right, so hopefully you'll understand that once you're on 8, the upgrade to 9 should be relatively easy. Um, another thing I would love to see us work on is, um, is automatic updates. Uh, it's something that we have made some progress on, but arguably not enough. Uh, I personally believe that it's one of the most important things for us to work on. You know, making Drupal updates easier is really important. Um, and today it's, you know, fairly complex still, right? Here's an example of a minor update or a patch update. You need to do all of these commands. Obviously, you can script them, but you have to update code and databases and configuration. You have to do that on your local host and deploy to production. And so really, it's a lot of steps, too many steps. <laughs> And it requires a developer. And you, can, you may have to do this multiple times a month, right? So how do we make that easy? And so I hope that this week we can spend some time on that. Uh, I hope we can refocus some of our energy on this problem. Uh, we need to work on composer support and core and contrib. We need to find help to coordinate some of these initiatives. Uh, good news is, though, the European Union has decided to provide some funding for this which is pretty exciting, yeah. So I feel, I feel pretty good that we're gonna make progress and I'm gonna, I hope that in DrupalCon Amsterdam in six months I'll be able to stand on stage and actually give some sort of demo. That would be my goal. And so obviously <laughs> I would need your help uh, with that, but that would be fantastic and I think it would really kind of round out the Drupal 8 release um, you know, cycle. All right, so obviously all of that work is important because it helps with security, it helps make it easier for organizations to maintain Drupal, and again, it benefits organizations, small and large. And again, probably more beneficial for small organizations 
who can afford to have developers on staff, right? Um, so very important work and lots of good progress. Uh, and so this is kind of, you know, sort of sums it up a little bit. All of the different things that we've been focused on, as you can see, we've been working our way up the mountain to the flag. Uh, we've made a lot of great progress. And personally, I feel pretty pumped, actually, <laughs> even though I may not communicate that well. Um, but I feel pretty pumped about all of the progress we've made um, between layout um, and media and preparing for Drupal 9 and you know, all of these things. And I really feel like we found like a rhythm and a cadence and a heartbeat. Every six months, we're shipping new features. We're innovating. Um, you know, things are growing. I feel like we're ready for the future with API first and things like that. Um, and we're making Drupal easier and easier to use. We're making Drupal easier and easier to maintain. And I'm really excited that that benefits uh, basically everyone. So to recap, um, Drupal 8.7 will be released in three weeks. And it's jam-packed with innovation. Um, Drupal 7 has community support until November 2021, and we'll have commercial support after that for at least another three years. There are many reasons to upgrade to Drupal 8 now, um, and you should if you can. Um, Drupal 9 is targeted to be released in June 2020, and updating from 8 to 9 will be easy, assuming we manage deprecations well, and we will, right? Um, I've put all of that together in this little timeline, uh, which I'll share in my slides when I share the slides in my blog. Maybe something you want to print out, hang up next to your bed or in your cubicle, um, <laughs> send to your manager maybe. But it puts it all kind of together in an easy to use visual. Um, and then the call to action, you know, let's work on being more and more diverse and inclusive of others something that we all can help with. It's something that all of our organizations can help with. Um, let's start removing the use of deprecated code. Um, and let's start removing it now, because we get to benefit from that now. The benefit doesn't come with Drupal 9. The benefit comes today, because you're using better, more modern APIs today. And last, let's try and refocus on the automated upgrades problem. I think we've done a great job across the board, all of these tracks, amazing progress. But I wish we could really make a little bit more progress on the automated upgrade prog uh, problem. And um, I think we can. And so let's try and do that, make it a focus the next six months between now and DrupalCon Amsterdam. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>